From Washington to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm Kevin Cirilli. And from New York, I'm Taylor Riggs. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. And Kevin, we get straight to the world of business. The Dow, of course, hitting 30,000. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abigail, we know the smart money likes the S&P because it's market cap instead of price weighted like the Dow, but still it's 30,000 and it's a round number. It certainly is. Stocks are really off to the races here. You wouldn't know that we had this virus, the COVID-19 uh, really surging and of course increasing restrictions. Traders really looking past the optimism of the second half of next year when hopefully the vaccine is really moving through uh, the economy. So here we have the Dow sharply higher above 30,000 as you talked about for the first time ever. Doesn't really mean anything uh, technically, but it's a big round number psychologically important folks generally like that and we see stocks climbing even more once the Dow did rise above 30,000 right now up 1.7% the Russell 2000 another all time high really leading the charge up 2.1% the S&P 500 up a solid 1.5% uh, an important Taylor the cyclical reopening rotation that we've had happening in recent weeks usually often it comes at the cost of tech but that simply isn't happening today the Nasdaq 100 today is up 1% so this this is really a Goldilocks uh, cyclical rotation right now on the expectation of a normalizing economy. And you know, I know that you and others have been talking about whether or not it's going to last because we've had these pockets of it on off again throughout the year. Well, if we take a look at the sectors on the month, Taylor it does suggest that this cyclical rotation is really very much on the way. Take a look at energy up 30% it, heading to it toward its best monthly performance ever. That is the FOMO like buying we have around energy, but it's also for the other cyclical sectors such as industrials and financials. So we really have stocks off to the races in this holiday shortened week, Taylor. And it's interesting, Abigail, as we talk about the reflation trade and the outlook for politics as well going forward. We're taking a look at bond yields also up three basis points on the 10 year, five basis points on the 30 year that goes into that cyclical theme that you were discussing. The outlook for bonds here with yields rising part of the reflation trade. Well, right now you can make the case that bonds are at the perfect Goldilocks level because you have bonds, the 10 year yield and specifically still in this year's range below 1%. So stock investors don't have to worry about yields going uh, too far too fast, which would of course bring into questions around valuation and discount rates and all sorts of other repricing of risk issues. But you also have bonds uh, at the higher part of the range. So it brings in the specter the idea that reflation, the perfect amount of reflation is right ahead. So long as the 10 year yield stays below 1%, it's a pretty healthy uh, spot. It seems that's what stocks are telling us right now above one percent above one and a quarter percent it could be a different story but right now uh, bonds are a part of this yes reflation trade our thank you there as always bloomberg's abigail doolittle i do kevin want to go and bring in uh christina romer university of california berkeley professor of economics and a formal council of economic advisors chair Great to have you, Professor. We've been talking about Yellen now as Treasury Secretary. What does she bring to the table? Oh, well, it's great to be with you. And uh, she brings so much. I was just listening to your description of what's happening to markets. And I, you know, I know I'm feeling a lot more, a lot calmer, a lot more confident this morning. Uh, and I'm guessing that they are too, in part because we're going to have a very, a uh, good uh, Treasury Secretary. So what she brings is obviously just this wealth of experience. Here's someone who has uh, worked both in administrations in the Federal Reserve, in the broader Federal Reserve system. So uh, she really understands the economy. She knows all the players. She knows the international players. Uh, so that's just fantastic to bring that, that experience tied together with incredible smarts. And uh, so that's, that's incredibly uh, valuable. I think the other thing she brings are uh, the right values. So what does she care about? She cares about unemployment, about getting the virus under control because she knows that's what's good for the economy uh, and good for people. Uh, she's gonna care about rebuilding our international uh, economic relationships. She cares deeply about climate change, something that you know, I think is uh, one of the most existential threats to the, to the world economy uh, and something that dovetails so incredibly well with 
uh, President-elect Biden's focus on uh, dealing with this long-run issue at the same time yeah. we're dealing with uh, tremendous short-run issues. You know, I, I remember when you were back in the Obama administration and, and covering the recommendations that you had given to the Obama administration about the needs for there to be, uh, and he at the time was president-elect, for the need to be more fiscal stimulus. And I, I'm curious, we're facing a very similar debate right now where uh, former Fed Chair Yellen, soon to be likely Treasury Secretary Yellen, has been out front appearing at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum and other uh, uh, events where she's been urging there to be more fiscal stimulus. Now, Leader McConnell, as you know, has said that he doesn't agree with that. So what advice can you give the incoming administration in order to try to get enough support for there to be additional fiscal stimulus? Uh, so first, I, I certainly want to, to echo uh, uh, former Fed Chair Yellen, I don't know what to call her these days other than Janet, <laughs> um, to, to say that absolutely the economy is in a tenuous spot with the, the virus surging, with um, some of the indicators starting to look uh, a little shaky. This is exactly the time you need some help to the economy. We, we've got the, the prospect of a virus, of a, of a vaccine, uh, but it's going to be a while, and we've got to get through these next uh, uh, couple or several months. So I think uh, that is going to be a priority. You know, I, I think if anyone can navigate this, I think Janet's likely to be able to do it because she's built good relationships with, uh, with Congress, uh, with members of the Senate from both parties. So I think she may be uniquely well situated to be able to, to, to navigate this. I think one of the things, especially if we want to, to get something fast, uh, they're gonna have to, of course, work with, with the Republicans and that may and be um, you know, not getting everything that you want, but, but saying, uh, what can we do that's going to make a real difference uh, in mm -hmm. people's lives, right. in the economy, uh, and might have bipartisan support? Because that's um, that's what we're going to need. And to follow and up on this, what can you tell us uh, uh, about how uh, a Secretary Yellen would deal with the international component of her job, especially as it relates to chairing CFIUS, for example, and tariffs and sanctions, uh, because that, of course, has been increasingly a new, a, a larger and larger part of the secretary's portfolio in recent years, even before the uh, Trump administration. No, absolutely, and you know, our a lot of our international relationships are in tatters, and. Uh, so I think that is going to be even more of a job uh, than normal. I think, you know, part of how she, she will approach this the way she does everything. Janet is a planner. She figures out what needs to be done. She games it out. She uh, pushes her staff hard to come up with um, good policies and, and every possible uh, line of the decision tree. So she will be out there. She will be... Uh, as soon as able, traveling to these international meetings, rebuilding our relationships. But of course, she's got them. She's been at uh, G7 meetings for years because uh, she was Fed chair. So she knows the players. They trust her. They know her. They respect her. And I think that will uh, make it much easier to uh, to deal with the trade issues. And you know, we're going to have the issue of international fiscal coordination. So uh, one of the things that was done back in 2009 was for uh, countries throughout the world to say, let's all fight this thing together. I can see her helping to lead uh, a charge for something like that uh, worldwide. You know, on that theme of fiscal coordination, on the margin, how helpful is it that she seemingly has a good relationship with the Federal Reserve, given she just came from that role? <laughs> So it, it certainly can't hurt. Um, you know, I think right now there's, there's no issue. I mean, uh, Secretary Powell has been as outspoken about the need for fiscal stimulus as uh, Janet Yellen has been. So I think monetary policymakers understand that their tools are somewhat limited today and they see the damage, they see the unemployment, and they want fiscal policymakers to help. 
Uh, so yeah. I think the, okay. the fact that she will have good mm -hmm. communication with, with uh, Chair Powell is certainly valuable, yeah. uh, but I yeah. think um, you know, her, her main communication is going to have to be with Congress. Okay. Okay. All right. Our thanks to Christina Romer. Happy Thanksgiving, the former chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors in the Obama administration. And coming up, we get more on President-elect Biden's cabinet selections with Jim Messina, who ran the Obama-Biden presidential campaign. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Kevin Cirilli in Washington. And I'm Taylor Riggs in New York. Let's now get to Mark Crumpton for the Bloomberg First Word News Update. Taylor, Kevin, thank you. Pennsylvania's top elections officials have certified that Democrat Joe Biden's victory in the key battleground state. It's another significant blow to President Trump's efforts to overturn the election results. The certification is the official declaration that Mr. Biden won Pennsylvania and its 20 electoral college votes. Electors for the state will cast their votes for Mr. Biden when they meet on December 14th, unless a court intervenes. Some Senate Democrats are calling on YouTube to take down videos with what they call false and misleading information about the election. In the letter, the senators say because President Trump refuses to commit to a peaceful transition of power, quote, misinformation and manipulated media content on your platform may fuel civil unrest, end quote. YouTube prohibits videos that incite violence, but says it allows clips, quote, expressing views on the outcome of the election. The European Union and other donors are offering new funding for Afghanistan. A largely virtual pledging conference in Geneva drew representatives from more than 70 countries in the first such event in four years. The EU pledged $1.4 billion in assistance to Afghanistan over the next four years, but like many others, made its support conditional on the country's commitment to democracy, the rule of law, human rights, and gender equality. David Dinkins, who broke barriers as New York City's first African-American mayor, has died. Mr. Dinkins had a calm manner, a dramatic shift from both his predecessor, Ed Koch, and his successor, Rudy Giuliani. Dinkins was doomed to a single term by a soaring murder rate, stubborn unemployment, and his mishandling of a riot in Brooklyn. Dinkins' wife, Joyce, died last month at the age of 89. David Dinkins was 93 years old. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Kevin? Thank you, Mark. Pennsylvania's top election officials have officially certified President-elect Biden's victory in the Keystone State. Now, this deals another significant blow to President Trump's effort to overturn the election results and comes as the Biden cabinet is starting to take shape. For more insight, I want to welcome now Jim Messina, who is the former Obama-Biden campaign manager and former deputy chief of staff to President Obama. Uh, and, and former President Obama yesterday, uh, Jim, uh, speaking who... to the Washington Post and saying uh, that he believes that the team that President-elect is established is going to be able to uh, get us out of this uh, pandemic. How do you think that someone, or how do you think rather, Treasury Secretary Yellen and a State Department uh, led by Tony Blinken will work together internationally in order to uh, turn the corner with uh, the pandemic? Yeah, it's a great question. And so, you know, when I was in the White House, I worked with all of these people who are getting these major jobs today. And the truth is what you look and see is just competence. These people are incredibly good at what they do, and they are really well respected around the world. There isn't any world economic leader who doesn't know Janet Yellen on a firsthand, first name basis. She's also able to bridge the ideological divide inside the Democratic Party. She's respected by both sides. Tony Blinken is one of the most competent people People I've ever worked with. He knows every single foreign leader around the world and in incredibly important coordination that's going to have to happen uh, with agencies, with governments, with world leaders. 
um, these folks are going to walk in the room and know exactly what to do and be respected and not have to spend real time getting up to speed. And so that's why I think these picks are so smart because the word competence just keeps coming back to me over and over and over. So in the last segment, we spoke with Christina Romer, who, of course, was uh, one of the chairs of the National Economic uh, of Advisors during the Obama administration. And one of the things that she did during the last of the Obama transition was to advise that there be more fiscal stimulus. Well, flash forward 12 years later, and now we're having the same Washington debate about the need for more fiscal stimulus, something that former Fed Chair Yellen has been advocating for. You know the halls of Congress. You know what it takes to strike a deal with Leader McConnell. How can a President Biden do do that uh, with more fiscal stimulus? Well, I think Christina was exactly right in her comments to you, which is we're going to have to make a deal. And that means that neither side's going to get what they want. I was White House Deputy Chief of Staff when we cut the first deal on the economic stimulus bill in 2009. And the truth is, good deals have both sides, you know, saying, oh, I wish I would have got a little bit more. And, you know, the other thing is we're going to need to have the business community and the world all on the same page saying to both Democrats and Republicans, get this done. Don't play politics. I thought Jamie Diamond was exactly right last week when he said that both sides were acting a little childish and need to just get to the table and get this thing done. And I think that kind of spirit is what Biden's going to bring. You know, when I was in the White House, we went to the vice president over and over again when we wanted to cut a deal because he was the one who was respected and knew both sides and could get these things done. I think that's exactly what he's going to attempt to do uh, in the in the White House as president. And I think the Republicans, not on everything, I'm not going to be Pollyannish about this. I don't think we're going to run and hold hands into the river. But I think on major things like a stimulus bill, like a budget bill, he's going to be able to get it done. Is getting things done as it relates to stimulus uh, just passing what we can agree on versus Nancy Pelosi's all or nothing approach, which then leaves us with nothing. Why can't we at least pass what we can agree on? Well, I think the speaker has said that. The speaker said repeatedly that she wants to get a deal uh, going forward. And I think, you know, what Biden is good at is saying to both sides, hey, let's be reality here and get this done. And I saw him do it in the economic bill. There would be no Obamacare without Joe Biden because he was the one who helped me get the final votes for that. And that's what Joe Biden is so good at. And that's why I think given the team he's putting together, real kind of very smart, knowledgeable people like Janet Yellen, who, by the way, has been confirmed by a Republican Senate in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she's going to have the respect to walk into McConnell and say, look, let's put aside the politics. This is what we need to get done. Jim, big picture here, just going forward. What is the mandate to govern, given that the second largest vote went to Trump and the biggest non-white vote since the 60, 60s? What does that mean for the mandate to govern going forward? that voters want both sides to work together. They unseated the first president, only the third president in 100 years, but they kept control of the Senate in the Republicans' hands. That is a very clear mandate to both parties to say, hey, let's get along here and get just the basic block and tackling of government, lower the temperature, enough with the politics, let's just get some easy things done. And that's what the voters want, that's what America wants. And let's be honest, that's what America needs. And quickly, just in the 30 seconds or so that we have left, I mean, we talked about Congress, but the governors increasingly right now because of the issue of the pandemic and COVID cases across the country, red states, blue states increasing. Uh, the governors are going to play a crucial role here. How is that relationship going to work with the executive branch? Boy, it's true. My college roommate is the governor of Montana, and he and I were talking the other night about this, and he was talking about how important this is. You know, not a Democrat, not a Republican, doesn't matter. The governors have to work very closely. And part of this is putting science first and putting politics aside and just saying, what are the things we got to get done? And that's what I'm really hopeful that Biden can do. Just put the science and the economics first and put the politics for later. Thank you, as always, former Obama campaign manager Jim Messina. Great to have you. And, Kevin, it's a big round number that we like to talk about, even though the Dow, of course, <laughs> is a price-weighted, not market cap. It is Dow 30,000 for the first time ever, and that folds over into record highs that we continue to see on the S&P 500 and the cyclical trade. Russell 2000 also fresh record highs. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Kevin Cirilli in Washington, D.C. And I am Taylor Riggs in New York. Kevin, it is time for our stock of the hour. Fresh record highs across the indices. But we go and do a deep dive into some of the individual stocks, like marijuana stocks, also spiking today after the GSA approved a transition to a Biden government. And Machandra looking at what is next for the pod stocks. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah, we're seeing some really double digit pops for some of the biggest and best known names within that sector, talking about the likes of Tilray, the likes of Sundial, the likes of Aurora as well. But if we bring up a Bloomberg terminal chart, we have two that will show you that the industry as a whole also benefiting from this investor uh, enthusiasm. What we should be able to show you is the MJ. That's the biggest pot ETF. And we're seeing the daily moves there up around about 6% today. And that mirroring what we saw in those first days after the election. And that's because investors is really expecting a Biden presidency uh, to be beneficial to that move towards greater legalization of cannabis. They've heard both Biden and Kamala Harris be more supportive of cannabis reform. And of course, we saw more of the states act positively in that direction at the time of the election. Investors really thinking they're going to get some action on a federal level, Taylor. You know, Emma, it's interesting. Everything is higher, but you also take a look at Tilray in particular, increasing the cash flow with the debt swap. That seems to be the theme of the day. Debt is free. Everything is 0%. So why not? <laughs> Yeah, that's absolutely right. And really that being a bit of a, showing a bit of investor enthusiasm for that particular stock. As you mentioned there, we're seeing that debt conversion, converting about $124 million uh, worth of debt stock into about uh, 6 million shares for an existing bondholder. Also, as you mentioned there, helping to strengthen the balance sheet uh, for Tilray and removing a big chunk uh, of interest obligations. Jeffrey today, Taylor, calling it a shrewd move. Emma Chandra, thank you, as always, for joining us. We appreciate it. And stay with us because coming up next, the role of the U.S. on that global stage. We speak with Eurasia Group President Ian Brummer about what President-elect Biden's team could tell us about his foreign policy priorities. This all comes, Kevin, as more headlines cross Nevada. Certifying election results also showing a Biden victory. So that seems to be more clear through and through. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Taylor Riggs here with Kevin Cirilli. Let's get on over to the First Word News, and we do that with Mark Crompton. Taylor, thank you. Although President Trump is finally calling on his agencies to cooperate in the formal transition process to a Biden administration, Mr. Trump is still not admitting he lost the election. He tweeted repeatedly today about election fraud, including a retweet that says, quote, I concede nothing. The General Services Administration has acknowledged that Joe Biden was the apparent winner of the election. That gives him access to current agency officials, briefing books, and other resources. The president is due to hold a news conference any moment now. President-elect Biden reportedly will name Michelle Flournoy to be Secretary of Defense. NBC News says the announcement could come today. Flournoy was Under Secretary of Defense during the Obama administration. She would be the first woman to run the Pentagon. New York City will have vehicle checkpoints at key bridges and crossings and will strictly enforce the travel quarantine. The Sheriff's Office announced today it will conduct spot checks when out-of-state buses drop riders off at the curb. Test and tracing teams will be on the ground to direct individuals to testing sites and provide education on quarantine. Violations of self-quarantine will be enforced and may carry fines of up to $2,000. Princeton University says all undergraduates can get back to campus for the spring term that begins in February. The Ivy League school says it made the decision after establishing an on-campus lab and cultivating strong public health practices. But returning to campus doesn't mean an end to heavy restrictions. Parties and most other social gatherings will be prohibited. Masking and social distancing requirements will apply throughout campus. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. 
I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thank you, Mark. Now, President-elect Biden is set to formally announce key foreign policy and national security appointments 1 p.m. Eastern. He is also expected to nominate his longtime advisor, Tony Blinken, as Secretary of State, marking a return to a foreign policy strategy focused on alliances. Joining and us Taylor, now, Eurasia Taylor, we actually, we actually hear President Trump, and let's get to President Trump live at the White House. Absolutely incredible. It's, uh, nothing like that has ever happened medically, and uh, I think people are acknowledging that, and it's having a big effect. But uh, the stock market's just broken 30,000. Never been broken, that number. That's a sacred number, 30,000. Nobody thought they'd ever see it. Uh, that's the ninth time since uh, the beginning of 2020, and it's the 48th time that we've broken records in during the Trump administration, and I just want to congratulate all the people within the administration that work so hard. And most importantly, I want to congratulate the people of our country because there are no people like you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Gosh, Kevin, I mean, you help me here. What is your your key takeaway from that uh, short and sweet? It was a short and sweet remarks uh, in which uh, the president just appeared momentarily inside of of the uh, Brady briefing room at what, uh, according to our colleagues reporting, Taylor, was a last minute uh, press conference in which White House staffers were rushing to get into uh, the Brady briefing room. That was f a very brief, brief public commentary uh, from from President Trump, uh, Taylor, right there. And still no formal acknowledgement uh, of of what is going on, even as GSA has now signaled that the transition uh, is going to move ahead. And the headline on the terminal uh, captures it beautifully. Trump discusses stock market in a very short press briefing. Let's get to Ian Bremmer of the Eurasia Group, uh, Eurasia Group President Ian Bremmer. I mean, your reaction to that very brief commentary from President Trump just moments ago? Um, he's not doing a lot of governing, Right. I mean, uh, coronavirus continues to be the most important story out there. Uh, you, you'd like for at least until January 20th, you'd like the president to be out in front on it. Uh, that is that's not the case. Um, and I also we haven't seen a concession from President Trump. In fact, he fired uh, Christopher Krebs. I know that seems like a year ago it was just a week ago. This is the man that's actually entrusted with ensuring election security, and he fired him for not upholding President Trump's own uh, calls of election fraud, which are completely without merit. Um, and so, uh, look, it, it, ultimately, it doesn't matter to the outcome, but it does matter because uh, he has an enormous megaphone, and a lot of people believe him. Uh, you have a large number of Trump supporters in the country that actually think the election was rigged. And, and that means that their willingness to believe in the institutions of the United States are deteriorating. Uh, it makes it a lot harder to govern, a lot harder to lead by example internationally. I mean, you think anyone's going to listen to the U.S. when we criticize other countries for their electoral irregularities? When we have a president that's actually said that the election's been stolen, it's, it's a joke, right? So that is a problem. Uh, it is a problem that will resolve itself in the immediate sense, and the markets will be just fine with it. You saw it bouncing on the Yellen announcement for Treasury just yesterday. But, um, but the deep structural issues with the United States not having the kind of institutions that we used to or that countries like Germany and Japan, the Nordics, Canada do that's something we're going to be living with for quite a long time. Ian, I asked this question yesterday, and I'm desperate for your thoughts. A lot of people thought that Trumpism and the thought of America first was in reaction to eight years of Obama and trying to work with alliances and trying to be tough on China, but only doing it with alliances. Are we just going back to that? How is this time different? Um, I think there's a little bit of both. I, I think that Obama as president, with Biden as vice president, were much more multilateral in orientation. 
They wanted to work with allies. Um, but they were also pretty reluctant to use to deploy American power. And I think Trump signaling with America first very clearly, much more unilateral, much more transactional in orientation, um, and much more willing to deploy American power. And by the way, if you look at the wins that Trump has gotten over his four years, whether it's with South Korea or the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, or whether it's with allies on the China 5G front, or, yes. or even driving the new peace deals happening um, in the Middle East, leaving aside the Palestinians, all of that was a unilateral America-first approach. Um, I think the wins that you saw under Obama, like the Iranian nuclear deal, for example, or a constructive movement on climate, were largely multilateral deals where the Americans were working with allies and weren't driving its power by itself. But there's an enormous amount of distance between those two approaches. You'd mm -hmm. like to believe that a Biden administration is not going to simply revert to the status quo ante of the Obama administration, but will actually find some lessons from some of Trump's successes as well. And I'll tell you that from my personal conversations with um, those that are in the new cabinet, uh, they do recognize that some of the things that Trump did actually worked and actually worked better than the old Obama approaches. And I think they are ready to learn from them as well. So, uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we're going to head to a more constructive place here. I want to I want to pick up with something that you just said about 5G, because coming up, we're going to hear from the Undersecretary of Economic Affairs, Keith Kroc, who has just yeah. been able to secure the more than 50 now nations around the world that are uh, adopting to their clean 5G network protocols and really going against the Chinese. And the U.K. yesterday suggest, uh, saying that they could ban Huawei technologies as early as next calendar year. From your conversations based with individuals in the incoming administration as it relates to 5G and China, do you think that they will continue in that vein of trying to secure a clean 5G network uh, for, for Western allies and not with the Chinese? Um, I believe that uh, the Trump foreign policy on 5G, specifically in terms of Huawei, has been the most successful foreign policy they have implemented in their entire administration. As you mentioned, they've gotten a surprising number of allies signed up. And this, this didn't exist as a policy uh, before Trump. And I know for a fact that the incoming Biden administration understands that success and wants to continue along those lines. But you asked me very specifically about continuing the clean network policy. And I want to be clear that I think that the Biden administration will not just be focused on the national security components, but will also be engaged much more with the American private sector to help ensure that the policies we implement actually don't um, hamstring our own private sector companies that are trying to develop globally. And that is a that's a push and pull. It's like if you think about CFIUS which you know, looks to review uh, investments from a national security perspective. It's not just about Homeland Security doing that review. You need the people from Commerce and Treasury also involved. You want to understand how it impacts American economic interests, not just national security interests. And I, I think that the Biden administration approach with China will be more blended in that regard. Ian, are our allies willing to be tough on China? Depends on the ally, right? I mean, they're much less willing if we're not doing anything. Uh, if I think about Europe, the Germans are more willing to be tough on China. The East Europeans, who are part of the so-called 17 plus one with Beijing, they all join Belt and Road. They're all getting a lot more money in an environment where there's not so much money to be had. I mean, you know, you, pro you probably know that there is the announcement last week of the RCEP agreement. It's the largest multilateral trade deal in global history. The United States has no part of it. China's driving it. You know about Belt and Road. Um, it is uh, the largest uh, framework for infrastructure investment globally. It's being driven by Beijing. 
the United States has no equivalent. So if you're asking American allies, would they rather join with an American architecture or Chinese architecture, they would say an American architecture. If you say, would you rather join RCEP or nothing, then they'll choose RCEP. Would you rather Belt and Road Investments or none? I mean, look, I will tell you right now, as an American, I would rather the Chinese develop ports in Sri Lanka than not have a port because that port will lead to growth. I'd much rather if the port was driven by Americans, Europeans, Japanese, but that's not on offer. So unless we're going to start spending real money and doing real long-term strategy, and remember, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Trump spiked, but Obama couldn't get it done. It was his policy. They failed. Yeah. They failed. So if there is no American option, it's not clear to me what exactly we're asking our allies to do. So many thoughts and perspectives. We're grateful always for your time, Ian Bremmer, Eurasia Group, and G Zero Media President. And coming up, we will speak with Congresswoman Haley Stevens of Michigan on whether Congress will come to a stimulus deal. We're still waiting. Clock is ticking. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Taylor Riggs in New York. And, and I'm Kevin Cerulli in Washington, D.C. Joining us now is Congresswoman Haley Stevens, a Democrat of Michigan. And Congresswoman, give us the play-by-play. -play. When are we going to get more fiscal relief? Well, we need it, and we know we need it now. Um, we're right now a few days before Thanksgiving, and certainly no one's being prepared to, to take a vote. But it's clear from our small businesses to our public schools to our state and local budgets that we need a relief package just as we needed one uh, in, in early summer. And I'll tell you, you start to look at the spike in cases, and right now, in some ways, Kevin, it's all eyes on North Dakota, right? There's just an exorbitant rate of uh, fatalities and cases, lines around the block. And I mention that because that's Republican leadership in that state that could really come to the table with Democratic leadership in the House to say, let's get a package done because our small businesses can't withstand this. Our job loss, it can't go on like this. We need to be able to buoy our economy and get through to the other side of this pandemic. It's in some ways very similar to where we were in the early days of this virus. Well, to follow up on that precisely in terms of getting past the hard line and getting past where the both sides are dug in, you've worked with Republicans before. You're much more of a centrist Democrat. In terms of another round of fiscal relief, do you think it's going to take Republicans in red states where the virus has surged in order to put pressure on compromise? We want to see that. I think that there's a real opportunity for that. One of the other ongoing questions, Kevin, is, are the Georgia special elections. And I, I heard earlier today uh, a, a thought posited on, on television. Hey, are we going to see Mitch McConnell not come to the table because of the special elections in, in Georgia, which in many respects is exactly the opposite of what the American people want, right? They want an end to the politicking. They want an end to the politics above everything and the deal to get done for the uh, American worker, the American small business. I'll, I'll tell you, you're, you're absolutely spot on. I, I've worked on both sides of the aisle. I worked in the Obama administration on the U.S. auto rescue. Little known fact that the, the Bush appointees came to the table with those of us in the Obama administration to get us through the first 100 days. That auto rescue team led by Steve Ratner was also comprised of, of Republicans, people who have gone on to run for office <laughs> in the Republican Party. But yet we were a team united to save the U.S. auto industry. And now when we're looking at the, the balance of the American economy and getting deals done, we should be able to do this. I have, I have withheld this or I've, I've withheld this notion that you know, look, we don't need to get cynical. We just got to get to to work. And so I'm maintaining those conversations. I've got good relationships with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking extreme viewpoints. And I'm continuing also to advocate for what we need here in Michigan, which is, my goodness, that support for our small businesses, Kevin. So then why can't you or what pressure have you put on Speaker Pelosi to work with Mnuchin and do a piecemeal approach versus an all or nothing approach, which leaves us with nothing? 
Well, we certainly saw Mr. Mnuchin somewhat explode last week uh, when he called on the Federal Reserve to return the dollars that had been allocated to the Federal Reserve to buoy our economy. Those programs weren't being the, used. Yeah, during the, 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 the CARES Act. Well, look, I've, I've been very clear with, with my leadership. I don't think we need to get uh, into the race to the bottom with the dollar figure. I, I think what we need is is relief. Uh, and I've regularly taken to the House floor and, and spent the time listening, right, and spent the time listening. But right now in this environment, we're also removed from one another, uh, which, is, which is also what's causing problems. So the letter writing campaigns that go on, obviously spending time with my, my constituents and reconfirming that. I work really closely with about a uh, dozen or so of the mayors and township supervisors right here in my suburban district in Metro Detroit. Most of them, by and large, are on the other side of the aisle. So I take their viewpoints and and, and bring them together and then share them with my, my House leadership. What is it, Taylor? We need our fair share of federal funding. That's what we need. We don't need, and they say, hey, fiscal responsibility. I think that's really important. I call it return on spend, the return on the taxpayer dollar that's 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 being right. spent and we're keeping the heat on yeah. you know certainly we wanted to get a deal done the house is voted we know that we have the words from mitch mcconnell we don't think it's time to act moving forward on a, a, a supreme court nominee talking to yep. my u.s senators here in michigan who are also frustrated we're grateful for your time congresswoman haley stevens democrat of michigan this is bloomberg This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Taylor Riggs in New York. And I'm Kevin Cirilli in Washington. It's time for a Bloomberg exclusive. I spoke to Keith Kroc, Under Secretary of State for Economic Affairs, and we discussed economic growth, energy, the environment, and much more. Kevin, I think that, you know, what began as a pilot in terms of the clean network, I think is this is one of the... Uh, things in terms of the Chinese Communist Party that's overwhelming success. And I think to hit on that thread of an alliance of democracies, uniting those democracies around the world based on democratic values, it turns the tables on the Chinese Communist Party. And, it, it, and if you look at uh, where this can be uh, uh, extended to that we're already doing, it's in areas of clean infrastructure. Um, it, it, it's in areas of clean financing, uh, clean minerals, uh, clean supply chains, clean energy. So I think this is a magic formula that is timeless. And, yes. and when, when this got announced, we announced it as a comprehensive approach to addressing the long, uh, long-term threats of the Chinese Communist Party. And it's built on a coalition of trusted partners. And, and, and that's countries, companies, and civil society. So I think I, it's a winning formula. I have two more questions for you. I remember traveling with Secretary Pompeo at the start of this year uh, in Latin America, as well as in, uh, throughout Jamaica uh, as well. And, and it was not uncommon uh, to see Huawei buildings and Huawei signs all throughout the downtowns. And so I, I guess, could we be looking at a significant shift in that as a result of this network uh, of the Clean Network Initiative over the next couple of years, where maybe China doesn't have such uh, a, a, a presence in their technological endeavors in uh, uh, countries that are so geographically close to the United States. By the way, you're so right, uh, and, and around the world, because if you look at what has happened, it has totally turned the tide on Huawei. That was part of my interview with Keith Kroc, who is the Undersecretary of Economic Affairs at the State Department. And you can hear more of that interview cross-platform uh, on the Bloomberg. Look at and, you, cross-platform. Uh, you know, <laughs> Taylor, I try. I try. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. And we are awaiting a speech from the Biden-Harris transition team, and we will have that as well. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.